Hey, Coach Rianzo here with BTB Lax. Today we want to go over lacrosse field 101. We want to talk to you about some of the positions on the field and the terminology that's used by a lot of coaches to describe those positions. If you're a youth player just starting out or even maybe a high school player with a little bit of experience, this will be really helpful for you. You'll be able to pick up on some of the things your coach is trying to communicate to you. Also, if you're a more advanced player, you're definitely going to learn some things, some terms that you've never heard before that you can apply if you go on and, and play into college. Also, for you youth coaches or even high school coaches maybe who don't have a lot of experience and for parents who are trying to follow the game, you're definitely going to pick some stuff up. So uh, let's get going. Okay, so we want to go over the 12 spots on the field that you need to know. The first two we want to go over, and this is a little bit confusing, it's the X versus the face-off X. And if we head over here to our field, What's known as the X is the area behind the goal. Okay, and this is where if we had three attackmen in the game, we might have them lined up in this type of formation with our three middies in this type of formation. And we'd call this a 2-3-1 offense. Two middies, uh, three, two attackmen, and one midfielder. So three players here and one behind the goal at the X. So the X area behind the cage is where this attackman has the ball right here. And this is typically where you'd have your best ball handling attackman, the person that's going to probably break down the defense off the dodge, but also be one of your best feeder looking for guys off ball. This is where your most dynamic attackman is going to play. And this is obviously it's a really important part of the field because a lot of the action happens behind here to set up plays and scoring opportunities here. One thing to note, if the uh, ball is behind at X, the goalie for the other team has to turn with his head and eyes facing behind the goal. So what that does, if there's a quick feed, let's say this midfielder cuts, these guys just crisscross, let's say, and we feed one of these two middies, this goalie has to go from looking behind the goal at the ball to being able to locate where the ball went and also stop the shot. So that's why we get the ball behind, because when you transfer it up above, there's some pretty awesome scoring opportunities there. Okay, now the difference between this X behind the goal and the face-off X is pretty obvious, um, but a lot of times coaches just say X. So if the other team scored and there's a face-off, your coach may say, get to the X, which means you're facing off, um, as opposed to running a play, getting the ball through X, which would mean behind the cage. Now the face-off position, and we'll do a separate video about this, it's one of the most important positions on the field. It helps gain possession. Possessions are key in lacrosse. Um, but understanding the difference between the X, the face-off X, and X is pretty important. Okay, the next spot on the field we want to talk about is the face-off line. So we just talked about the face-off X, which is in the middle of the field. It's where the face-offs occur after goals and at the beginning of each uh, quarter. The face-off line is this white line here. It's 10 yards from the sideline and it's 20 yards from the midpoint of the field. All right, and each team, when the face-off begins, we have our face-off man, which is known as a FOGO, face-off get-off. We've also got our short stick midfielder, and we also have a long stick midfielder. So if the blue team is attacking the goal that way, we would have our long stick midi on the side where this midfielder doesn't typically draw the ball. So he's got more of a defensive posture typically, although there's a lot of variations to this. And honestly, we could do a, a video just about wing play, and, and we probably will. Um, so one thing just to, to think about, if the face-off is occurring, and this guy, this midfielder's stick is faced like that, so he's on the ground with his stick in this direction, typically he's going to pull the ball this way. So you want to have one of your fastest guys one of your best ground ball guys, and one of your best players in this spot, the short stick midfield position. Uh, so when the faceoff begins, the red team's got to have one guy on this wing, one guy on this wing. The blue team has to have one here and one here as well. They can move up and down anywhere they want. This is kind of the general vicinity that they would typically line up. Um, but as the whistle blows, the faceoff will occur here. The two wing players for each team are free to come in in any direction that they want. Okay, and again, they can start anywhere on this line. They just have to make sure that they're behind the line. They could come all the way down here. They could come all the way down here. They could come to the end of the line, but no further. All right, so again, if the face-off occurs, 
This face-off guy may pull it in this direction or he may pull it directly behind him. Of course, he can pull it to himself or he may lose it too. Um, but this midfielder typically wants to be the guy that's ball hawking. He's looking to get to the ball and get that ground ball. Typically, we don't want to just come in and try and smash the, the other guy facing off. It's illegal, first of all. You have to wait till the ball comes out, then you can make contact. Um, so a lot of times they'll run in, there will still be a scrum here, and they'll just got to hang and wait for the ball to pop out. Okay. Typically, the long stick midi will take a couple steps in, but also keep in mind a defensive posture. So he's looking in case the red team picks the ball up here and starts to come down the field, he's looking to maybe um, you know, cut that off and stop a fast break. There's a lot of variations to this. I don't want to get into all of them right now, but a lot of teams might have the long stick midi too just go hip to hip with the short stick midi on the other side. So instead of taking a defensive posture, the long stick midi may get right up next to this guy. There might be some nudging back and forth and he might just run wherever this midi goes. Okay, so again, there's a lot of variations to it, but those are the basics. That's the uh, face-off line and some, uh, some of the nuances of, of face-off play. Okay, the next part of the field that we want to talk about and there, three of them are kind of pretty similar. The box, the offensive zone, the restraining line, and the alley. And the box or the offensive zone and the restraining line are all really similar. So let's talk about that first. So the restraining line is this area here. Um, the box is this the entire area below the restraining line. So coaches, officials will refer to the box, the offensive zone, the restraining line, the restraining box, caught kind of all interchangeable language. But the basics of it is, is if the blue team is advancing the ball and playing offense on this cage down here, okay, they're going to do most of their work below the restraining line okay, in that offensive zone. The mid midfield dodge may happen outside the box or above the restraining line, but most of the work that they're going to do is going to be you know, in this offensive zone. There are a lot of rules about advancing the ball up the field, how much time you have to advance the ball in the box and get a shot, and I'm not going to get into all of those because... They're pretty confusing. That could be its own section. And honestly, the rules are changing all the time. So the point is, when you hear get it in the box or get, get to the restraining line, these are the parts of the area of the field that we're talking about. Okay, now the next thing that has to do with the, the box or the restraining box is the alley. Okay, and this, this isn't necessarily perfectly to scale, but the alley is the area on the outside of the box. Okay, and you'll hear that a lot in the clearing game. Okay, if, if uh, the blue team was clearing this direction and a defender had the ball or the goalie had the ball, you might hear a coach say for the defender to get wider into the alley so he positions himself outside this uh, restraining line here, okay, uh, the box line rather. Also, the alley is used if this midfielder is dodging, the red team may want to force him down the alley. So this midfielder might take away this side here and force the Dodger not to be able to go to the middle of the field, but to go this way. And while he's not actually running in the alley, forcing him down the alley is the terminology. And that's kind of in this general vicinity on the side of the field. Okay, so it's just a, a part of the field that coaches use um, to kind of instruct players on where to go, what to do at certain times. Right, the next part of the field we want to talk about is the crease and the dot. And we'll talk about the dot second. So let's just talk about the crease. The most obvious use for the, the word crease is the area around the goal, the circle around the goal. Okay, and as most of us know, offensive players can't go in the crease on their offensive half. Defensive players, as long as they don't have the ball, are allowed to run through the crease area. The goalie's in there the whole time. Okay, so this is the crease area. But... The crease actually has a, a different meaning as well that can be a little bit confusing. You might hear, if you're a midfielder playing out here, you may hear your coach say, get to the crease, okay? And he's not talking about standing in the middle of the goal or even getting inside this circle. He's actually talking about this area here, okay, which is the area in front of the goal. So that's where for a young player, that can get a little bit confusing. You know, you're standing out here and Maybe the ball's behind and your coach is yelling at you, get to the crease, get to the crease. He's talking about this area here, not the other circle that's surrounding the goal. So that's a little bit confusing. Um, other teams call this different things. Uh, they may call it the paint 
okay? Kind of like in basketball, to try and have an analogy there. Um, they, I've heard people call it the heart of the defense, things like that. But this is the crease area, the area in front of the goal, okay? And in my time at Georgetown and Notre Dame, and now at BTB, um, we also came up with another term called the dot, okay? And the dot is a more specific location directly in front of the goal. It's about a two foot by two foot area that's really close to the goal. And so the crease is kind of a general vicinity in front of the goal. The dot is a tiny, not tiny, but it's a smaller section right in front of the goal. And the purpose of that is when you're talking about team defense, let's assume that the ball was behind, um, with this attackman, okay? Defensively, we would want the backside midfielder in this case, not only to get to the crease to help guard the, guard the crease, but we would say get to the dot. Okay, that tells him he's really got to hustle and he's got to get in nice and low. Really get to the, to the crease, to the core of the crease so that he can help guard whatever offensive players are in here. And then if the ball were to swing, you know, over to, if there were an attackman here, swing the ball here, swing the ball here, obviously that midi would leave the crease area, leave the dot, he'd come back out to where he initially was. Okay, so it's a little bit of a more of a specific thing and it's a nuance, but it's a great thing, especially for youth and uh, high school coaches to incorporate that dot into your vocabulary. It's just a more specific area in front of the goal. It can really help with teaching points. Okay, the next area of the field that we wanna talk about is the substitution box. Sounds simple enough, but it's actually one of the most confusing parts of the game. Um, it's absolute mayhem over here in the substitution box. So in lacrosse, you can substitute on the fly. You don't need to call a timeout or have a dead ball in order to substitute. Everything happens on the fly in and out of the game, kind of like hockey. Okay, so just I'll briefly explain kind of how it works. Um, let's say in this case, the ball's down here with the blue team. Okay, they've got one, two, three, four, five, six guys in the game but one of them happens to be a long stick midi because they just came down from the defensive end. He needs to get out of the game. In college, you might see all three middies come out of the game because of specialization. Um, these might be defensive midfielders and they need to get out for offensive midfielders. But again, we won't get into all of that because that's that could be an hour long video in and of itself. Um, so let's say the long stick midi needs to get out and we need to get our best dodging midi in the game. So the long stick midi can exit the, the field anywhere between these two hashes here. Okay, and the substitution box is only on the one side. We might have the blue bench here. We might have the red bench down here, okay? And you can go on either half of the field while you're substituting, okay? You just can't pass this hash mark. You cannot enter the field on the other side of the hash mark. It has to be through this substitution box right here, okay? That's the only place you can enter and exit the field. All right, so the long stick midi, will come out, of, out through the box. Once he steps over the, the uh, sideline in the substitution box, then that frees up our offensive player to come on in his place. So it's a one for one trade. If they decided you know, he gets in there and plays offense to get this guy out, he can come out as well. Once he gets over that line, we can sub another midi in too. Okay, now there's some really crazy stuff that goes on at the substitution box. Sub, both teams substituting three guys at a time just a lot of guys running in and out. There's also some really specialized stuff that teams do that I, I really don't, I can't take too much time to get into, but I'll just show you one quick thing that might occur. Okay, if there's a defenseman in the game, we're trying to get this long stick midi out, they might run a defenseman out of the game, run a midi on the game and he, in the game, and he might you know, go to the middle of the field and just wait. And once this long stick midi crosses the midfield line, then this offensive midi can go. Okay, and now you've got a defenseman standing over here waiting to get back in the game. This long stick midi comes out. Okay, this guy's already in the game now. Okay, as soon as that long stick midi gets out, the defenseman can go back in. So it's just a shorter distance from, this, uh, from the offensive zone to get over the midfield line than it is to get all the way over here. Doesn't look like much, but it's definitely a lot closer. Okay, so a lot of teams do some tricky stuff with that, and it gets really confusing over here. And, and all college teams, at least at the Division I level, have one coach just 
assigned to just run the substitution box. And it's crazy, it's hectic over there, but it's a lot of fun and it's important too. You get in and out of the game quick, you can gain an advantage, and it's a really important part of the game. Okay, the last few spots on the field that we're gonna talk about are the GLE, or goal line extended, the island, and the money spot. Okay, let's start with the GLE. For some of you that have played before, it's simple enough, it's the goal line extended. So if your goal line is here on the goal, goal line extended means it's the line that would imaginarily, is imaginarily a word? Imaginarily run out to the sideline. Okay, so goal line extended is important for a lot of reasons. Attackmen use it to judge where they are on the field. Once they get to the goal line extended, they know there are different things that they can do. Defensemen use it because once the Dodger, once they get into this area to the goal line extended, they'll hear their goalkeeper call drive or push, or they'll have some terminology that they use to push the attackman away from the goal. Um, and in the clearing game, it's important too. You know, defensemen, if we were clearing uh, from this end that way, you know, they'd want to maybe start around the goal line extended. So it's a term that's used. It's a spot on the field that's really important to know. And uh, obviously, it's, it's pretty simple to remember once, once you know what it is. The next thing we want to talk about is the island. And this is kind of a unique term that not everyone knows about. Um, but it's really, really important, especially for defenders. Okay, the island is the area near the goal line extended but it extends out, I would call this the uh, five and five or the money spot, we'll get into that in a second, but that's, it's about on that trajectory, about five yards above and five, five yards above the goal line and five yards away from the goal and same thing behind. So it's this whole area in here and in here. And the island is, is significant for defenders uh, there's a saying that we have at BTB, no checks on the island, okay? So if you're a defender and you're guarding an attackman behind who's got the ball, once you get to this island area, okay, we have a rule, no checks on the island. So that would mean you're not getting your stick and trying to do all crazy stuff, trying to take the ball away. You're just going to get in front of your man. You're going to hunker down. You're going to push, play body position, use your strength, and try and push him out in this area here. Okay, same thing on the other side. Okay, we don't use that term too much for the offense, um, but it, it's primarily a defensive term, but it's a good one. No checks on the island. If you have a defenseman that goes over the head here and tries to take the ball away or throws a crazy wrap check or something, you know, if the coach has taught that day in and day out, no checks on the island, it's a simple term to tell them you know, what they need to be doing in this area of the field. Okay, now the next one, which I alluded to very briefly, is the money spot. A lot of teams call it the five and five. Okay, let's just erase one side here. And we call it the money spot. I'm gonna put a dollar sign there. Because this is where attackmen make their money, okay? It's five yards above the goal line extended, and it's five yards from the middle of the field. Okay, if attackmen can get to this money spot, this is where they're going to be able to do a lot of damage and get a lot of scoring opportunities. So and we'll talk about it in a separate uh, video, dodges that you can use to get to the money spot, dodges that you can use once you get to the money spot. But this is the area on the field where if you're an attackman, if you're an attackman, you do whatever dodges. Once you get here to this money spot, you know you've got a chance to score. And again, it's five yards above the goal line extended, five yards to the side of the middle. Okay, well that's lacrosse field 101. And there was some pretty elementary stuff in there, but there was some pretty dynamic and complex stuff in there as well. So for some of you guys who are beginners, some of the stuff might have been a little bit of advanced, but that's okay. And if you're a specific position player, attackman, defenseman, midfielder, and you heard some things in this presentation that interest you, we're going to have other videos that address a lot of these specific things in a lot more detail. So just surf around our channel and take a look for some of the, the topics that we covered today, and you're going to learn a lot of great stuff. Did you know that there's just two simple things that separate the average youth and high school lacrosse player from the elite guys that are ready to go on to play in college and beyond? Yep, just two simple things. 
We teamed up with college All-American and multiple MLL All-Star Mike Kimmel to put together a completely free, 45 minute long, three part video training series that's gonna show kids and parents exactly what those two things are. What you need to be working on if you wanna take your game to the next level. And nope, it's got nothing to do with hitting the gym or running till you puke. If you're serious about improving as a player and you wanna become one of the best guys on your team, get more playing time and catch the eye of college recruiters, you have to see this free video training. Just click the link below in the description of this video and you'll be taken to a page where you can ask to receive instant access to these free videos. Join the thousands of high school and youth players that have already seen Mike's awesome training and take control of your game today.